I'm really super excited to give you a uh, warm welcome to this seminar on race and colonial Latin America. My name is Rosario Inés Granados. I am the Marilyn Toma Associate Curator Art of the Spanish Americas at the Blanton Museum of Art. And I'm here basically as um, uh, to give you an introduction, to give you a little bit of background of why we have this series at the museum. Um, in 2016, when my position was being um, put together with the um, um, support of the Toma Foundation, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of uh, Fine Arts, and the School of Architecture of the University of Texas at Austin um, decided to give us support for these kind of um, um, academic meetings. And since the spring of 2017, we have organizing these distinguished um, visiting speaker series on the art of the Spanish Americas uh, with the goal of growing attention to the art of the Spanish Americas across campus, but also outside of it. And, um, and I'm really thrilled of, of having uh, this first uh, webinar going live. Um, I hope you agree with me that having this, the, the abundance of webinars uh, these days is one of the only good things that the pandemic had brought to us. And I think it is um, an amazing opportunity to uh, be able to connect with people that are not in, in Austin. And so we're really happy to, to, to be able to, to meet old and new friends and colleagues that can in this way join us. Uh, but now, um, well, the, 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 this series, we organize them where uh, only uh, twice a semester and we're going to follow the same program and that's why we're going to have one more in November. Some of you know more and uh, we'll let you know uh, at the end of the seminar when is the next one. But now let me just introduce our session's moderator, Professor Dr. Susan Dean Smith, who is an Associate Professor of History here at UT Austin and um, who is also the co-organizer of this series. Some of you have heard me already say uh, how much we value her constant support at the museum. And I will say it again, because really working with her has been a privilege. Susan is co-editor with Miruna Achim and Sandra Rosenthal of her forthcoming anthology called Museum Matters, Making and Unmaking Mexico's National Collections. And she is currently completing a book entitled Matters of Taste cultural reform in Bourbon, Mexico and the Royal Academy of San Carlos. Some years ago, she co-edited with Ilona Katsu, who I think uh, may be in the audience tonight and who I really thank you for that um, already. Uh, that book that they coordinated was called Race and Classification, the Case of Mexican America. Um, and she's also an extraordinary, extraordinary article published in the Colonial Latin American uh, Review in 2005 called Creating the Colonial Subject, Casta Paintings, Curiosities, and Collectors in 18th Century Mexico and Spain. Without further ado, I let you, Susan, take it from here, thanking you again for all your support and for moderating this panel, who I think has been really a success. I think we have almost 500 people joining from different places. And uh, she's going to let us know about certain rules, because I see now that we have people are writing comments on the chat. And one of the first things that Susan is going to say is that we prefer the Q&A. Um, but I let you, Susan, thank you again for being here. OK, well, um, Rosario, thank you for those very kind words. Um, and um, let me echo Rosario's uh, welcome to everyone, even though I can't see anyone, but I know you're out there. Um, before we begin, I do want to run over uh, the, uh, the so-called ground rules. Um, as you probably gather, your audio is muted so no one can hear you, and only the panelists, as you can tell, are visible on screen. We'll be taking your questions from the uh, Q&A window. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, including one labeled Q&A. Um, click on that and type to, uh, to send your uh, questions, and please do try to use that instead of the chat function, please. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our speakers. Um, Elena Fitzpatrick uh, Sifford, 
who is assistant professor of art history at the Baker Center for the Arts, Muhlenberg College. Ellie? Ellie? Hi. <laughs> And uh, our second speaker, Ananda Cohen-Naponte, who is Associate Professor of History of Art uh, at Cornell University. Nandi? Hello. Um, we're going to begin um, with Elena and I want to um, give uh, their brief bios, first of all. Uh, Elena's research centers on race, representation and cross-cultural exchange in colonial Latin American art with particular focus on depictions of Africans and Afro-descendants in new Spanish painting. Her recent essays have been published in Ethno History, Latin American and Latinx Visual Culture, and the Art Journal. She has essays forthcoming in Emotions, Art and Religion in Europe, Africa and the Americas, 1400 to 1800, and Visual Culture and Indigenous Agency in the Early Americas, New Approaches and Interpretations. Um, and the title of her talk will be Indigenous Artists and African Subjects in the Visual Culture of the Spanish Americas. Um, Ananda works on the visual culture of colonial Latin America with special interests in issues of cross-cultural exchange, historicity, identity, and anti-colonial movements. Her recent publications include Heaven, Hell, and Everything in Between, Murals of the Colonial Andes, and um, artistic splendor in the Andes. She has published essays in the Colonial Latin American Review, The Americas, Alpanches, Fres, and Latin America and Latinx um, visual culture, among others. She is currently conducting research on a new project that explores the role of the visual arts in fermenting an insurgent imaginary, uh, excuse me, in late 18th century Peru and Bolivia within a context of inter-ethnic conflict and rebellion. And Ananda will speak on race representation and alterity in the colonial Andes. Um, as a preparatory comment to Ellie's presentation, um, I just want to say that the presentations that we will hear this evening represent new and provocative directions in a burgeoning literature across disciplines that have increasingly focused on the role of visual and material culture in the making and marking of race in colonial Latin America and the Ibero-American sphere. One highly influential and path-breaking work, of course, is Ilona Katsu's meticulous study of the genre of Costa paintings that depict racial hierarchies and racial mixings. The Costa paintings provide visual evidence of the tensions between racial fixity and racial malleability and mobility within maturing colonial societies, a counterpoint to the stark racial divides and fixities in British North America, for example. But the genre of Costa paintings occurs at a particular time and in a particular, excuse me, that of the 18th century and in the context of the enlightenment, as well as a particular place produced primarily in New Spain. The robust literature on the Costa paintings has served to stimulate research such as that we will hear about this afternoon that seeks to continue to deepen our understanding of the constructions and visual codifications of race over time and space and to examine different types of visual and material sources such as religious imagery and indigenous codices in order to identify and map perceptions and constructions of not just racial mixture, mixture but of racial difference and where and how those constructions and boundaries are generated and why and how they change. Such approaches and research has never been more urgent and critical than at this particular moment, as we confront the bleak histories of race and difference, both past and present. Um, we will begin with uh, Ellie. Um, Ellie will speak for about 15 minutes and then we will stop for a short Q and A um, for Ellie and then move on to Nanda's presentation. So let's begin with Ella's presentation, Indigenous Artists and African Subjects in the Visual Culture of the Spanish Americas. Thank you for that introduction, Susan. My talk today focuses on the role of Indigenous artists in both New Spanish and in both New Spain and Peru in rendering the earliest images of Africans in the Americas. 
Um, inspired in part by Leonette and Xi's concept of minor transnationalism, examining indigenous and black interactions via the visual arts forces us to look beyond a binary indigenous Spanish model that often dominates colonial Latin American art history. By examining these various images, all painted by indigenous artists, we gain a wider understanding of both the visualities of the black body and the vice royalty, as well as the interactions and negotiations between Africans and indigenous peoples. Ultimately, what emerges is the plurality of roles, visions, and relationships that while entrenched within a Spanish colonial system, were not purely defined by it. The earliest surviving signed painted portrait in South America renders not a Spaniard, but the so-called mulattoes of Esmeraldas, Don Francisco de la Robe and his sons, mixed African and indigenous noblemen who lived in an autonomous community of escaped, formerly enslaved people on the coast of Ecuador. The painting was commissioned by a Spanish judge in Quito named Juan del Barrio Esopolvera and executed by an indigenous artist of that same city by the name of Andres Sanchez Galque. It commemorates the signing of a treaty between Don Francisco's people and Spanish colonial administrators. The treaty, which maintained Esmeraldas's autonomy, meant the end of conflict between the two groups and therefore signaled the judge's successful so-called pacification of the Ecuadorian coast. Without any iconographic precedent, Sanchez Galque created a portrait of great strength and originality. The sitter's costumes combine indigenous, African, and Spanish styles, including golden pectorals, lip plugs, and earrings, as well as necklaces made from shell and bone and European lace collars. Although in the letter to Philip III that accompanied the painting, Sepulveda describes the men as barbarians, Sanchez Galque imbues the men with a sense of self-possession and dignity, perhaps, as art historian Tom Cummins has noted, a nod to his admiration of their autonomy from this Spanish society in which he, an Indian, was subsumed. Sanchez Galque's portrait is fascinating for its triangulation of viewpoints, Spanish patron, Quechua artist, Afro-Indigenous subject. We see a similar trio in the Codex Azcatitlan, a manuscript created in the mid 16th century by Tlaquiloque, artist scribes from the city of Tlatelolco, the sister city to the Mexica Aztec capital in neighboring Tenochtitlan, modern day Mexico City. Plate 23, the march of the Spaniards into Mexico records the Spanish army led by Cortez and Malinche, a Nahua noble woman who became Cortez's interpreter. The two are followed by numerous armed henchmen and a trailing group of indigenous, likely Tlaxcalan porters bearing heavy loads. The soldiers wear armor and carry lances and shields, their faces obscured by their helmets. The singular African in the group stands out markedly. He is placed near the front with only one soldier between him and Cortez. Painted a dark brown skin tone with curly black hair, the figure wears fine and colorful clothing. He holds a spear like that of the other soldiers and the reins of, of a singular horse belonging to their dismounted leader, Cortez. The image crystallizes not only the colonial encounter, but the ethnographic observations of the indigenous artist. Even before the Entrada, scouts sent by Moctezuma to survey the troops on the coast noted their varying skin color. The Nahuatl account in Sahagun's Florentine Codex reads, they, the Spaniards, were called and given the name of gods who had come from heaven, and the blacks were called soiled gods. While the Spanish translation makes no differentiation between the color of the black skin of the conquistadors themselves, los negros, and the concept of the black gods, dioses negros, the Nahuatl translation differentiates between these two. The Nahuatl, Nahuatl word, Tlicue means black people or black men, a term that was likely invented in this early contact period from the root word tlili, meaning soot or black. Yet when referring to the gods, the Nahuatl text describes them as tlicue tecacuatli or soiled gods. 
This description of the Black conquistadors as soiled gods likely derives from Mexica's associations with Blackened deities. There was a relationship between darkness and holiness seen in the Nahuatl word teotl, which translates as God or sacred essence and also refers in some cases to blackness. We know that Mexica priests often painted themselves black to honor male deities and to embody the sacred prestige associated with blackness. In this, con in this context, it is not surprising that the Tlacuiloque noted the African physiognomy that was noticeably darker than that of the Spaniards and perhaps conjured pre-conquest notions of blackness and its connection to the divine. In contrast, Europeans associated blackness with ugliness and sin, while whiteness was seen as beautiful and holy. As Erin Rowe has pointed out, when meditating on the black skin color of Sub-Saharan Africans, Franciscan missionary Juan de Torquemada decried blackness as a deformity, so ugly it was clearly a punishment from God. These earliest images of Africans then indicate that the Spanish dislike of blackness was not understood by the indigenous Tlacuiloque as such a binary distinction perhaps did not exist in the Nahua cosmology. Africans in fact are given prominent places within the narrative of the Entrada and its consequences. A slightly earlier manus manuscript provides another view of Africans rendered by a Tlacuilo. The black figure in the Codex Teleriano Romensis, perhaps the very first recording of an African person in the Americas shows the individual as a symbol of the repercussions of a major slave uprising that took place in Mexico City in 1537. The annotator reports the rebellion of the Negros and the subsequent hanging of their leader, as well as the smoking star comet and violent earthquake of that year. An Olean glyph representing movement of the earth through seismic activity is placed below the hanging figure. Beside him, also connected to the date sign above with a thin black line, is the smoking star or comet. Both earthquake and comet were natural phenomena associated with bad omens. All three images, hanged man, earthquake, and comet, are further indicators of the unrest of the early colonial period that punctuates this historic annal. The figure and annotation record events enumerated in Viceroy Antonio de Mendoza's letter to King Charles I of Spain. Mendoza, the first viceroy, writes of the election of an African king who plotted with Indian allies to overthrow the Spaniards and take over the lands of New Spain. Mendoza reports that an African informant leaked the plot. In order to quell the fledgling uprising, Mendoza sent Indians to round up revel uh, African leaders in Mexico City for arrest or execution. Mendoza suggests an increase in Spanish ships as well as a decrease in the importation of Africans, stressing that too many Africans would heighten the chances of these rebellions. Rather than configure this image as symbolic only of the vanquished slave, we may think as well of the figure as an active agent who rebelled against the conditions of slavery. Furthermore, the image may indicate indigenous sympathies with the plight of Africans. Mendoza mentions an, uh, an allegiance between the two groups and perhaps the prominent inclusion of the African as well as the import placed on the foreboding elements of comet and earthquake signify identification with the plight of Africans and indigenous people as played out within the manuscript. Examining these early images gives us a sense of the multiplicity of colonial relationships and the roles played by Africans in this viceregal system. I move now to Peru where we encountered another indigenous artist rendering Africans and their descendants. Chapter 24 of the Nueva Coronica by Felipe Guamang Poma de Aviala, which is a 2000 page manuscript with nearly 400 ink drawings written to the King of Spain, Philip III. In his, the chapter on the Black Africans, Guamang Poma explains his view of the place of Black Africans within the Viceroyalty. Drawing 27, um, Cristiano Negra, Negro, Negra que salen de Negros Posales de Guinea, depicts two figures with rosaries in hand kneeling in prayer before a, faint, a framed image of the Virgin Mary. The male figure is shown with curly hair, his hat placed on the floor in an act of reverence, while the woman's head is covered with a snood or hairnet. You notice that their figures are, are ex quite exaggerated, perhaps due to the lack of the use of color to differentiate race. As clearly, very clearly readable, 
as Black Africans, and they dress in typically Spanish attire. The author uses the word, Spanish word bolsales to describe the pair, a term derived from bolso, Spanish from muzzle, thus identifying them as having been captured in Africa before their arrival in the Americas. Spaniards view Busales as brutes who in Africa had been tainted by the influence of Islam and were prone to heresy and violence. Yet rather than describe the Busales as infidels who should be enslaved, Guaman Poma's drawing portrays them in a different light that emphasizes their fast and sincere adoption of the Christian faith, as does his text. He writes, the Bosal Blacks from Guinea, humble, most Christian, in them the faith grows quickly, resulting in excellent slaves. In spite of this, the Spaniards say that the Bosal Blacks are not worth anything, but they do not know of what they speak. Guaman Poma illustrates his point in the following drawing, how the good Blacks wait with the patience and love of Christ. It shows these same Bosales dressed as before, beaten by a Spanish master. Instead of kneeling in prayer, they beg for mercy from the sneering Spanish master who handles the crouching man's head and wields a staff towards his grimacing wife. In both text and image, the author points out that despite the good behavior and Christian faith, faith of the Bosales, they are met with cruelty from their Spanish overlords. This rhetoric largely parallels Guaman Poma's prime complaint in his letter, a moralizing argument, where he, he describes that the Spaniards were the ones who were not true Christians and were abusive to the indigenous people of the Andes, who had humbly and faithfully adopted Christianity. The manuscript includes a second category of African descendants, the, Cri the Negros Criollos, or Creole Blacks. Rather than shown as a couple, the Black Creole is depicted as a single male. Eric Vaccarella has pointed out that Guaman Poma associated the Black Creole with carnal sins. The author goes on to explain that they do these evil deeds with rosary in hand, indicating their hypocrisy and contrasting them with the truly Christian and well-behaved Bosales. He further charges that the influence of the Spaniards as the cause, the influence of the Spaniards as the cause of the nefarious behavior of the Creole Blacks. It, this um, image features a monetary exchange between the Creole Black in a Spanish outfit and a woman in an indigenous dress. Guaman Poma goes on to detail the sexual and familial relations between Black men and indigenous women, pointing out that the Spanish owners condoned intercourse and miscegenation between the two groups. According to the author, Black men also often raped indigenous women and the resulting mixed race offspring threatened the racial hierarchies of the vice royalty. He further states that the children of the mulatas look white and denounce their own black race. Guaman Palma then uses gender, family structure, and racial hierarchies to build his argument against Spanish abuses. He criticizes the loose morals of Creole blacks and um, as damaging to indigenous families and, and women and again, censure Spaniards for both condoning and thereby propagating such behavior. To conclude, we've seen several instances of mid to late 16th and early 17th century visual culture in which indigenous artists have rendered African subjects. Sanchez Galque's portrait crystallizes the racial triad of the vice royalty, Spanish patron indigenous artist, mixed race, Afro-indigenous sitters. While Guaman Poma may have advocated for separate Spanish, indigenous, Indian, and African states, the reality of colonial life shows instead the inevitability of the coexistence of the three. While Africans played a major role in the colonial formation of society in the Americas, discussions of this encounter have long been dominated by a dual Spanish indigenous narrative seen from the very beginning of the, um, as we can see in the very beginning of the encounter, um, illustrated by the Tlaquilo rendering Cortez and his men. Examining these early images gives us a sense of the multiplicity of colonial relationships and the roles played by Africans in the vice royalties as early as the first century after the conquest. Indigenous artists observe Africans as both slave and free, as Christians and sinners, and even as noblemen. By looking at the other, other, indigenous artists reveal to us the complexities of the colonial encounter 
and the ways in which indigenous African relations were integral to the development of colonial society. Thank you. Thank you, um, Elena. So um, we will move on with, I can find my notes here. Um, Ananda's talk, race representation and alterity in the colonial Andes. Nandi. Hi everyone. Um, let me share my screen with you really quickly. Thanks so much for the introductions. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just go ahead and get started. The invention of race in colonial Latin America was born out of a necessity for Spaniards to establish power distinctions over their colonial subjects based on skin color, facial features, lineage, dress, literacy, residence, clothing, comportment, and profession. Racial ideologies became codified in the visual realm to produce a seamless normalization of what was in actuality a violent and arbitrary denial of resources and full personhood onto non-European peoples. Indigenous, African descended and mixed race subjects continually push the boundaries of racial prescription in their daily lives as a means of survival within a restrictive social hierarchy. The term race as understood within a British imperial context of hypo descent or the one drop rule does not adequately capture the complexity and fluidity of casta categories in colonial Latin America. Nevertheless, this, is, this does not mean that the material consequences of institutionalized inequality were any less brutal. While the term race is not perfectly calibrated to the colonial Latin American historical context, uh, it is more imperative than ever that scholars, artists, community organizers, and elders talk about the historical origins of racial inequality and white supremacy from a hemispheric perspective as we grapple with its deadly legacies in the 21st century. For this presentation, I'm going to focus on visual representations of racialized subjects in the art of the colonial Andes to, pro to provide a broad overview of different pictorial strategies undertaken by artists to give visual flesh to racial hierarchies and pigmentocracies that upheld colonial power structures in Latin America over the course of 300 years. One of these pictorial strategies is through the racialization of space, whereby white subjects occupy the upper heavenly pictorial plane and raced subjects of indigenous and African descent occupy the lower segment. The evangelization campaigns uh, that took place throughout the entirety of colonial Latin American history, but most prominently in the 16th and 17th centuries are inextricable from the violent racialization of its colonial subjects. Within the realm of the visual arts, pictorial spaces once occupied by Muslim infidels became populated with equally brown but differently raced bodies. In these examples here, one actually from the Blanton Museum and the other at the Museo Uraundo in Luján, Argentina, we see the pictorial commemoration of key events associated with the spiritual conquest of Peru. On the left, the well-known Iberian iconography of St. James the Moor Slayer becomes recast as Santiago Mata Indios or Santiago Mata Incas, St. James the Indian or Inca Slayer. This example at the Blanton is one of countless uh, paintings produced in the 17th and 18th century representing the ap miraculous apparition of Santiago during the conquest of the Inca Empire in which he appeared like a bolt of lightning to vanquish the Incas in their capital city. Another episode during the same event involves the Virgin of Suntur Wasi, who miraculously appeared to prevent the Spanish conquistadores from burning inside of the chapel to which Manco Inca's forces had set fire during his failed siege of Cusco in 1536. The racialization of pictorial space conforms to Christian spatial orientations of heaven and hell that are transposed onto Andean soil through various forms of placemaking from, com from um, commemorative paintings like these to festivals that involve processions of religious icons and dances commemorating the conquest. Uh, and here as an example of that is this painting depicting the confraternities of Santa Rosa de Lima and La Linda, which form part of the series um, uh, of paintings commemorating Corpus Christi processions through the former Inca capital in the late 17th century. While much can be and has been said about this series, 
For our purposes, I just want to briefly point out the tripartite division of the composition into white Spaniards and Creoles at the top register in the same register as the processional statues, the indigenous elites at the center, and the plebeian classes at the bottom, which as you can note here, include a multiracial cross-section of colonial society, cueing us into the complexity and relative fluidity of race, caste, and class. In other examples, like the mural program at Andahuaylillas, the racialization of space also occurs in tandem with the strategic placement of objects associated with Andean ritual. Painted in the 1620s by the Creole artist Luis Sevillano and assistants, the image presents an allegory of good and bad faith that the parishioners would have encountered each time they exited the church. Uh, one aspect of the mural that has escaped the attention of scholars is the very faint depiction of indigenous sinners to the left of the church entrance on the hell side of the mural. And I will just um, give us a zoom in, no pun intended, um, of that. Three men turned straight toward the viewer unwittingly approached the claws of a ferocious hellmouth on a boat led by a demonic gondolier. Through ren though rendered with little facial detail, the men appear to encompass a spectrum of indigenous identities. The man situated at center wears an unku or a tunic decorated with two registers of tokapu or geometric designs woven into Inca garments. Two brown skinned men flank the central figure and their facial hair, cropped haircut and European style shirts by contrast suggest that they are either mestizos or indigenous elites. Next to this scene, a naked man receives copious amounts of liquid poured directly into his mouth by a masked figure. The light brown color of the beverage and the arribolose shaped vessel from which it is poured, known by the Incas as an urpu, excuse me, immediately identify it as chicha or corn beer, whose consumption was actively policed in the colonial period, both for its association with drunkenness as well as ancestor worship. These individuals are visually marked as occupying fundamentally different bodies from their white counterparts walking along the path to heaven. The brown skin of the figures matches seamlessly with that of the demons, differentiated only by their curled tails, snout mouths, and horns. Demons, in fact, were frequently characterized as mulatos and zambos, and more generally as dark-skinned creatures in the inquisitional and ecclesiastical literature. These vignettes thus codify racial difference through material culture, hairstyle, and proximity to anthropomorphized demonic figures, as well as through their stark uh, juxtaposition with white heavenly bodies devoid of worldly goods. This visual strategy persisted in other Andean depictions of hell. To take another example, Jose Lopez de Rios' 1684 painting located in the Church of Carabuco in the La Paz region of Bolivia provides an extensive visual inventory of all things Andean, from caros to panpipes. Two women in the upper register of the canvas hold an urpu and a caro and share a toast with a horned devil wearing a blue and white striped unku. Caros are flared wooden vessels used for the ritual consumption of chicha that continue to be produced by and for indigenous communities throughout the colonial period. The indigenous identity of the female figures is further marked through the exaggerated representation of the large silver tupu or garment pin fastening one of her shawls. Uh, next to them, a horned devil beats a drum with bells around his calves while the central musician plays a pan pipe with his left hand and beats a drum with his right. We should note that the two objects that make direct contact uh, with the human body, the caro and the pan pipe, are held by the left hand, which was associated with the sinister realm. In the 17th century images, sin was defined by one's proximity to contemporary Andean culture, defined loosely through an assemblage of objects, tunics, tupus, musical instruments, and drinking vessels. The sonic dimensions of racial alterity are also notable. Um, the figures play instruments that are indigenous to the Andes as compared with stringed and wind instruments associated with the musical traditions of the church. 
Now, there also exist examples of visual counter narratives to colonial constructions of racialized difference, particularly in the context of anti-colonial movements of the late 18th century. These are far more difficult to trace because of their deliberate occlusion from the visual record. There was a limited horizon of possibility in which these artworks could be produced and even more limited possibility of their survival. Just to take one example, archival accounts of the Tupac Amaro Rebellion of 1780 describe the formerly enslaved Afro-Indigenous artist Antonio Oblitas as the main portraitist for the rebel leader Jose Gabriel Kundurkanki Tupac Amaru, and he produced one painting in particular featuring, featuring the rebel leader surrounded by a flaming church commemorating the victory of Sangarara in which hundreds of mostly Spanish royalist forces perished. Other accounts describe uh, portraits that Oblitas painted of Tupac Amaro seated on a white horse. These may sound familiar to you because I would argue that uh, both of these descriptions appear to be subversions of conquest imagery that are reversing the compositional strategies of paintings like Santiago and the Virgin of Suntorwasi. As the historian Sinclair Thompson has demonstrated, the rise of terminology that specifically references whiteness in the 1780s emerges in the 1780s with the rise of Andean anti-colonial insurgencies. It is in these moments of political unrest that we start to see the introduction of new racial categories that supplant Espanol and Criollo with terms such as gente blanco, white people, sujetos de cara blanca, white faces, or the derogatory blanquillos, whiteies, and pucacunca, rednecks. Images like this one are infinitely ambiguous because we cannot trace the historical moment of their defacement but they are in line with a documentary record that described insurgents defacing images with white faces. We also have evidence of rebels defacing paintings and coins bearing the image of King Charles III as an act of protest against increasingly extractive and untenable colonial policies. In others, we see the visual translation of Pucacunca in full display such as in this 1802 mural by Tadeo Escalante, featuring um, hell as full of white skinned sinners in a church that had once served as a rallying point for Tupac Amaru's supporters. At the same time that we see the redefinition of whiteness by non white actors, we also see gestures towards notions of sovereignty or the commun, as both Thompson and Elizabeth Penry have suggested which articulated indigeneity from within rather than an externally imposed designation. For example, uh, we have accounts of Spaniards and Creoles intentionally donning uncus, the tunics I had talked about, and chewing coca leaf. And I quote here, there was a widely circulated rumor that said that any white person dressed in Spanish clothing had to die. As a result, all of the men and women, with the exception of those that were hiding, dressed in the clothing of Indians and walked on the streets and pampas chewing coca, and among them, a certain Don Jacinto Rodriguez who yelled, Viva Tupac Amaru! And the Pueblo responded, Que Viva! The account goes on to describe an unknown man going to the door of an administrative building and tearing off the coat of arms of the King of Spain. Now, the mode of dress described in these accounts conjure portraits of il indigenous elites that had proliferated in the decades prior to the uprising, as well as a reclaiming of some of the same cultural practices that were demonized in the previous centuries. They speak to a different kind of racial formation in which white people wearing indigenous clothing and performing Andeanness became a strategy for survival. Relinquishment of European clothing itself entangled within an increasingly fraught textile economy that exploited local weavers and favored Spanish imports signified the shedding of a social skin donned by individuals of various racial backgrounds and the privileges that came along with it. By way of closing, I would like to ever so briefly pivot to colonial Cuba. During the 1812 Aponte Rebellion, historian Matt Childs notes 
that enslaved insurgents referred to white people as el mundo, the world, while they referred to one another as compañero or camarada, or companion or comrade. Notable here is the distinction between whiteness as tied to a geographic totality and blackness as tied to kin and community. In both the Cuban slave rebellion and Andean insurgencies, we witness a radically different kind of world making, one forged relationally through shared visions of liberation rather through, than through control of territory or resources. And as we reflect on current interventions into monuments that have obscured the violent genocidal foundations upon which the Americas as we know them were brought into existence, the art historical record shows us that these struggles over race, representation, space, and place cut deep into the history of the hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you, Nandi. Um, we do have some Q&A. Let me get these up here um, and sort through these. Let me begin with one from um, Frederick Jones, and this is for um, Ellie. Um, Frederick poses the question, Ellie, are there residues of sacred blackness in the contemporary Andes? Um, this is a good question from my colleague, Frederick Jones. Hi, Fred. Um, I am not an Andean specialist, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that I can't quite answer that for you. Um, it's a really interesting question. Um, perhaps Nandi might <laughs> know more on that. <laughs> okay, um, we'll move on. And this is for Nandi. Um, this is from William Garcia Medina. Um, what are some limitations of using paintings as a viable method of analysis especially those painted from Castizos and Peninsulares? Um, sure. Well, certainly I think that, you know, I, I, I'm glad that we have these questions because there's only so much you can fit into 15 minutes. But um, certainly I think one thing that we always have to be aware of is using the dangers of using um, naturalistic painting as, um, as a, as having some kind of greater truth value than any other document or object of the colonial period. Um, and particularly when we're talking about Spanish or Castizo um, painters um, who are occupying a different social strata within the colonial situation, um, the types of representations that are being produced are heavily mediated um, and filtered through the colonial um, biases and systems um, in which they're created. Uh, a lot of the paintings that I was looking at or discussing in this presentation were actually produced by mestizo and indigenous artists in the case of Antonio Blitas an Afro-Indigenous artist, although we don't have um, the painting surviving today. And that of course brings in the other issue too, which is that oftentimes, um, artworks that are being produced of a revolutionary nature, particularly in the context of these insurgencies, uh, do not survive in the same way um, as other works of art. And so we do have these disparities in terms of the preservation of canvases um, and other types of art forms that we always have to be very attentive to. And just a quick follow up on that. Um... Nandi, and then I want to come back to a question um, for uh, Eleanor. Um, this one is from Ilona. Hi, Ilona. Um, uh, she wants to know, Nandi, could white performativity of indigeneity also be a form of mockery, depending on situation and context? Yes, um, absolutely, depending on situation and context. And I think that there is also um, a great deal of um, ambiguity even in these uh, documentary accounts of the rebellion, right? So um, in these are posed as uh, white uh, and Creole people dressing as Andeans as a way of saving their lives. Um, but certainly 
these are testimonies and confessions that are being extracted under situations of extreme duress. And so it is really unclear. Um, Sinclair Thompson has other, also uh, um, has other interpretations of this that perhaps this was a way of becoming incorporated within Andean notions of the commun. Um, but I think there is certainly a lot of ambiguity there and it's something that we have to treat very carefully depending on time period, place, um, context of political violence um, or the absence thereof. And um, moving on to um, a question for um, Ellie, and in fact, this is um, a question that uh, I also had uh, for Ellie. Uh, and this is from Alejandro Mayela Enriquez. Um, I wonder if um, you could address the concept of um, indigenous artist as an idea that may lead to uh, an homogenous understanding of the diverse epistemological frames of each cultural group. Thank you. Um, and I think this relates to a point you were uh, mentioning um, in terms of thinking about, you know, beyond just a single category of indigenous artists, um, kind of thinking about their socio-political um, sort of um, place. Um, all of these artists were, you know, members of elite groups, um, you know, thinking about, this, you know, the Tlacuiloque who were, you know, part of a stratified society. Um, coming from noble lineages and noble families. Um, and the, you know, the practice of the Tlaquilo was one that was not simply a sort of recording what was told, but it was a creative process. Um, Guam and Palma, of course, also a member of an elite, the son of a, a noble family. Um, land, they were landowners. They were, uh, you know, he was descended from conquerors and warriors from a pre-Inca empire as well. Um, so, uh, you know, what really interests me about this and, and sort of thinking about that, you know, these are these elite indigenous artists um, is how, just how unique these images are um, is really, you know, what's sort of fascinating to me. Um, you know, thinking about the ways in which Sanchez Galque, you know, represents the mulattoes of Esmeraldas who themselves, you know, while, you know, described in the letter as, you know, uh, savage or so on. They themselves were, you know, leaders and elites of their own people um, and eventually given a kind of an autonomy. Um, I'm really interested in the way in which, um, you know, in the Mexican manuscripts, these are real individuals that are being rendered, right? Um, you know, we, we think it might, uh, the, the um, African um, in the Escatilan image may be a man by the name of Juan Gortez. We can actually perhaps name this person. Um, and, and, you know, and in um, Slogan Romensis that it refers to perhaps not a specific person, but a very specific event, a specific moment in time. Um, and I think that that's what's really interesting and, and unique about these images. Um, later on, we see the development of more kinds of generic types for, um, you know, people of African descent. Um, the Black Magus, right? Um, the, uh, the allegory of the African continent, um, you know, stereotypes that we see in Costa paintings. Um, and so uh, sort of going forward, thinking about, um, you know, what is uh, sort of unique about these images, these early images um, painted by um, indigenous artists. And yes, that, you know, we are um, thinking about people who themselves were also, you know, members of, elite group, of an elite group or an elite lineage. Um, okay, well, I think um, obviously we could continue to um, discuss these wonderful presentations for um, another hour or so. Um, unfortunately, um, I think we're going to have to um, conclude this, this wonderful discussion. Um, thank you all um, for joining us and special thanks to um, our presenters, um, Nandi and um, Ellie, um, and I do want to uh, give also special thanks to our incredible um, technical support um, provided by Krista Ramirez. Um, before you leave, here are a few uh, reminders. Um, please join us for the next program in um, this series on November 19th, um, which will focus on inventiveness and invention in Spanish colonial art. Um, if you'd like to show your support, you can become a member at blantonmuseum.org 
backslash membership, um, or you can sign up for our newsletter at blantonmuseum.org backslash, backslash subscribe for info about upcoming programs and other news. Um, thank you again uh, for joining us. Thank you for the great questions and presentations. And I look forward, and Rosario and I look forward to seeing you again in November. <laughs>